Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central. It is a joy and an honor, literally, to have you here. You know, as a church, our mission is to help people discover Jesus and to fully own their faith in Him. And I don't know where you are on that journey, but that you're here matters. And so if you're with me here, if you're there, uh, wherever, whichever campus you're on, whether you're watching this online, I was visiting with some people uh, just before this service. Uh, one was from Boston. He said, we've got, got to know you from being online. There's a Boston fan there somewhere. <laughs> and um, uh, somebody else is from Florida. And they said, if you don't think online makes a difference, you have no idea. Uh, and so, hey, wherever you are in the world, man, really welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, we have been in a series that we wrapped up last week. It was called All In Together. And today we're going to start a brand new series, which you just probably figured out. So here's what I need you to do is open your Bible, take a moment and find uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. Uh, six chapters in is where we're going to be. And we're going to get there uh, in just a little bit. Now, as the lead pastor of a church, I need you to understand that as uh, life in the family goes, um, there are just times where you have to kind of call family meetings. And uh, I always think of this, and you've heard this before, hey, let's get in the family room, grab a pillow, let's sit on the you know, floor, lean up against the couch, whatever. Uh, let's just, we, we just want to have a time to talk. <clears throat> Sometimes the family talks that I have to lead as a lead pastor of a church are, are less than pleasant, where I have to tell you something that happened that I really, it's just really bad news, and, and no, I'm not going to happen today. That's not going to happen. But it, it, sometimes I, I just, I like, I'm just inside, it's just really, really hard. Um, I, I don't like being the bearer of bad news, but today I get to be the bearer of fantastic news, and I'm so excited to tell you what I'm about to share with you. And uh, lest I lead you along where you wonder, where is he going? Where is he going? Where is he going? I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to tell you the punchline of uh, what, what I'm here to announce to you, and then I'm going to tell you how we got there. Okay, everybody good? We good? Okay. I am absolutely thrilled to let you know that our board uh, uh, as a church has named the next lead pastor of Central Christian Church. And I am so thrilled. I am so thrilled to get to tell you about how this is going to play out, okay? So if you'll allow me, let me just give you some backstory. I, I'm going to do this from memory. I might not get every detail exactly right, but I'd rather do this than just read it to you. Uh, let me just explain what happened. About a decade ago, uh, and by the way, I've been on, uh, it, it was 37 years ago today that I first became a part of Central Christian Church. Thank you for that. But that's, uh, that's not important. But, but when uh, I became senior pastor, it'll be 25 years this coming April. But the thing is, about 10 years ago, the board began to talk about, Cal, uh, it's been awesome, but what happens if something happens to you? Like, what happens if you get run over by a bus? Why do we always talk about pastors getting run over by buses? <laughs> Uh, and I go, yeah, uh, I'll try to not let that happen. Well, I'm very, very happy to let you know, church, that for the last decade, I have avoided every bus that has come down the road in my direction. <clears throat> so that wasn't going to be the problem. We had a plan well, if that were to happen. But then about five years ago, we started talking, okay, Cal, there's a number of things that we got to talk about as a church. What happens if? And, and then there were some things that, what if you had a moral failure? What if your age caught up with you? What if uh, somehow... Um, you weren't able to finish sentences. What if you experienced burnout? All of the possibilities. So about five years ago, we started thinking, okay, we got to make sure that we're on top of this. This is the board, okay, the highest level of our church. And so we started thinking, okay. And then I said a statement. I said, okay, look, here's the thing. I, I want you to understand something, that there is no possible way it would be good for Central that I go past March of 2027. March of 2027, uh, this day in 2027 will be 40 years that I will be on the staff. And that's like, it's not good. We have to have another leader by that date. That's, and we always refer to that as our drop dead date. Maybe not the best of terms. Um, but the drop dead date would be April. So, um, uh, okay, that's the years, we're down to three years now, okay? And so uh, it's getting intense, okay? We we're, we're, want to make sure. It can take longer than you can ever imagine to find a successor. And so um, when I got back from my study leave last August, this has been priority one. We've got, to, we've got to get on this thing. So here's what we did. We formed a search committee of the board, uh, kind of a subcommittee of our board, and we tasked them with, um, uh, let's, let's go find some candidates and let's, let's go through this process. So here, here's what I said to the board. I said, look, I will help you but I won't influence you. In other words, I will help you. I won't, I'm not gonna guide you to a certain destination. I will help you uh, in the process as will our HR department, um, but that it's, it's gotta be a board decision. 
And if it's a good one, good on you. If it's a bad one, bad on you. Not me. You understand? Because I'm, I'm not going to be in that position any longer. So it's going to have to be a decision they make. So everybody understood that. And that was really, really clear. So they formed the search committee. And the search committee then came up with some criteria. Let me give you uh, the criteria real fast. Uh, we're looking for character, competency, credibility, chemistry, culture, and calling. Alliteration because we're pastor types. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so those are the things. And again, a, a week long explanation of each of those. I'm going to spare you all that detail. But we basically said that's who we're looking for. So uh, myself and uh, HR put out some names. Uh, here's some people that we think you should consider. Uh, people we know that we think could, uh, you know, rise up to this level and do this. And so we put these names out and then we basically tasked them, go, go discover who these guys are. Go listen to their sermons, watch their media online, pray about it. Uh, yeah, that sort of stuff. Go get some insight on who these guys are. And then a month later, we met again and we said, okay, from each of the people of the search committee, we need you to come up with your number one, your number two, your number three, your number four. Because in the ministry, you don't pit people against each other. I, I, and, but what we were positive, and this is really, really important, listen to me. We're not, gonna, we're not looking for anybody locally uh, that is uh, nationally that is wanting to be, like, we're not looking for resumes. We're, not look, we're looking for people who are doing a fantastic job where they are not in the least, but thinking about moving, but that we might be able to move uh, with a vision of who we are as a church. And it could be compelling and they go, I want to be a part of that. So that was the criteria. We're not taking resumes. We're not, you know. So here's the point. They all come in with their list of one through, you know, five or whatever it was. And, and, then, and then we said, okay, no, I'm not showing yet. Everyone, I need you to re reveal your number one. And I'd say I did it. It was actually led by another uh, board member. But you need to reveal your number one. Here's what I want to tell you. Every single, every single one of them had the exact same number one. And everyone had the exact same number two, by the way. And then three, four, five, or whatever it was, uh, th they varied. Same number one. So then they tasked me. They said, Cal, will you contact this gentleman and begin a conversation? I said, absolutely. So I did. And I talked to him and he said, I love where I am. I'm in a fantastic place. I'm not looking at, you know, we had this whole conversation. And then I said, listen, would you talk to your wife? I'm just going to ask you to pray about it. Just pray about it. Just see if maybe God, and he assured me, I'll talk to my wife. And I promise you before the spirit of God, if he leads us, we'll follow wherever he leads us to go. And so, okay, cool. Just do that. Long story short, some time passed, got back in touch. And he said, you know what? We think we should... Uh, we think we should at least look at this. So long story, we brought them out. We showed them the different campuses. We uh, met with different, uh, we met with the search committee. We met with the executive team. We did some life stuff and uh, they left. And then we got, what do you think? And everyone's going, it'd be perfect. It'd be absolutely perfect. Went through some more processing. I'm trying to go through a lot really fast. And then, and then the search committee said, is there any chance that um, you could get him to preach here uh, one weekend just so we can hear him preach in person? And I said, yeah. And uh, here's a clue. He did. There's a clue. There's a clue. Um, so um, we made those arrangements and he came and, and then, uh, long story short, more meetings, more meetings. And then the search committee uh, unanimously recommended to the entire board, this is the guy that we think. And then the board met and then the board met again a couple weeks later, flew him and his wife out, grilled and drilled them for about an hour and a half. And then uh, they, they basically said, um, would you uh, for, for, uh, excuse us, you need to leave the room while we ha have a chance to talk amongst ourselves. And so they sat in my office and for 20 minutes they deliberated, which is so not what happened. What happened was for 20 minutes we had to sit there while every single board member explained to every other board member why that person and that family would be the perfect family to uh, be the next lead pastor of Central. It took like 20 minutes and then they took a vote and they unanimously voted uh, this person as our next lead pastor. And then I got asked, go get him, let him know. I go, I'm gonna go punk him. <laughs> That's what I said. And they're like, no, you're not. And I go, yeah, I'm gonna go play a joke on him. He goes, no. And then they said, I'm fired if I do that. <laughs> That's what they said to me. And so I had to go down and go, okay, it took like forever. And here's why it took forever. They were not deliberating back and forth. They were all wanting to say why they really believe you're the best. And we're so excited. So we put it out there and said, hey, uh, we would love to offer you and invite you. And uh, if, you're, if you're wondering who I'm talking about, it's time for me to reveal this. Uh, couldn't be happier. It's this guy right here. This is, this is Sean Moyers. Sean Moyers.
Uh, Sean is the lead pastor of a fantastic church in Longmont, Colorado. Actually, the multi site there's different places, but Sean has uh, been the lead pastor for 11 years. He and his wife, Jen, are married for 20 some years. They have four kids, two in college, two yet in uh, uh, junior high, high school. Uh, uh, if you remember, he was, talk- he was the one that was talking about basketball, if that rings a bell, if you weren't, if you recall. He's a- First weekend of this year, he preached here, and people loved him. People going, you need to hire him. You need to hire him. I go, oh, you don't know how we're working. Anyway, um, so uh, he, is, uh, he has been a part of a group that I've talked to you guys about. You've heard about this, a group of pastors that I've led for the, over the last 10 years, actually longer than that, but that we meet multiple times a year, and I just poured my heart into him. He is as close to somebody who grew up at Central without growing up Central as you could get. He has been here, his board's been here, uh, very, very familiar with our church and our DNA. And it was all really, really, now, now you go, what's going to happen? Let me, now this is where I'm going to throw you out of the roller coaster if you don't hang on. Okay. Um, because I don't know where your mind's going right now. I want to explain to you what's going to happen. He's actually going to begin with us on the weekend of the 18th to the 21st of April. So he's wrapping up his ministry there now, and he's going to be here the 18th to the, now on, on that weekend, it's actually going to be my 25th anniversary being the lead pastor, Roy Lawson, who was the, my predecessor. I've invited him to come back. He's going to preach. It's because he started in April and ended in April. I will start and will end in April. And then, and then uh, uh, Sean. Now, now, but here's the thing. This is, again, we're going to have a great Sunday. We're going to have three bald preachers on the stage. It's going to be awesome. But here's what I need you to understand. And again, hold, listen carefully. I'm not leaving. I'm not done. Here's what's going to happen. Sean's going to come on our staff. On the, he's actually going to begin his ministry here on April 22nd, the day after the Monday. And um, he's going to work on my staff for one year. He's going to be the associate lead pastor of our church. It's already been decided he's the next guy. It's not a trial. It's not an you know, audition. He is the next lead pastor. We're going to spend a year. He's going to work with me so that we can transition everything. He's going to spend a year. He'll, he'll preach. Uh, when I don't preach, he'll, uh, he's going to Uh, get to know all the campus pastors, get to know the campuses, the councils. He's going to do all that kind of stuff. Work with me as I work with the board. He's just going to work with me over the next year on my executive team. And then one year later, which will be April of 2025, we're going to put, we're going to have a party and we're going to celebrate and we're going to place him as the new lead pastor of Central. And I'm, you're going to love this guy. Now the question uh, I've been saying, I, I don't know my future. Here's what I know. From now until April of 2025, I have a job. Okay. After that, I basically said to the board and to Sean, I'll do whatever. Uh, I, I'm not going to be on the exec team. I'm not going to be on the board. I'm not going to lead. I'm not going to, but if, if, if I'm needed to back, uh, back up preaching, if I'm needed to be a teaching pastor, you know, whatever I can contribute. I have no, at least and I have talked about this. We have no intention of going anywhere the rest of our lives, uh, but, but central. And so I just don't know. We're going to let that develop, and Sean and the board will figure out what to do with the, the old guy at that point. And uh, I'll just hang on, and we'll do whatever uh, they and God kind of say we're going to do. Now, here, here's what I want to address. Why did you not tell us this when we, we just did this all-in campaign? Why did you lead us through an all-in campaign? Folks, I talked to you about planting trees that you will not be the one that enjoys the shade of and that you will not be the one who enjoys the fruit of. I talked about passing on for the next generation. What, we, what I have led is what I believe is the right thing to do, and we are financially sacrificing to make that happen. I knew all along that there was a possibility that it would be in somebody else's hand to actually fulfill it and see it through. But I'll tell you what, that's the way it works. And I am so thrilled because we're going to be a part of this church, and I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to be involved in ministry, and I'm, we're going to, it's going to be so good. But it's, it's so wonderful to be to be able to stand in front of you and tell you that the board is absolutely elated over this. I am absolutely, my wife Lisa is absolutely elated and the exec team is elated. We are in fantastic hands. So I can't wait to introduce you in person to Sean who will be here on that weekend. But get, hey, great news, yes, yes, all right. Good, good, good. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to pray, let's pray. And then uh, we're, gonna get, uh, we're gonna get to a short message today because that, This is probably the most important thing that I've shared with the church over the last 25 years. It took some time. It was worth our time to spend to do that. Now let me get to the the message and and then I'll I'll explain what we're doing. So let's pray together. So Father, thank you for Sean and Jen and their kids and God, just what you've done at Rocky for fantastic church and just how you have led them. And God, 
uh, just the joy of watching them bloom and blossom and just all kinds of wonderful things. But then over the years to get to know Sean and to share the heart of ministry that we share in the DNA and, and then for him to uh, uh, be called by you to this position. I know our church is just in fantastic hands. And God, we just pray that we just continue to be faithful and continue to keep our eyes on you. And uh, I'm, I'm very confident of the future of our church. So thank you for answering that prayer. And uh, we, we love you and we praise you and we love following you. So it's in your name, amen. Hey, one last thing I forgot to say, speaking of Ann if you didn't turn your commitment card in, I want to encourage you to do that. It's really, really important for the future of our church. Also, you can do that online and uh, one way or the other. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are a person who financially makes all this happen because it's the only way it happens is people like you and me, uh, then uh, let us know what your intentions are so we can make the plans for the future. Okay, so I'm going I'm to put a situation out in front of you and I want to ask you how, how you'd handle this. So if I said to you, hey, uh, and I called you out, um, and I said, uh, like, hey, I need you to get up here and pray. And uh, I need, uh, hey, um, hey, Davina, Davina Bear, come, no, I'm just kidding. I know she's in here because I was harassing her coming in here. Davina, don't come up here. I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, Davina, come up here and pray. And so we're just talking about, if you got put on the spot and you were called out and all of a sudden you weren't prepared and you just, you just walk up and, and they put a mic in your hand and they make you pray. And like, you're like, ah, pray out loud? Like, it, like where people can hear me, where people can see me, where I don't have notes, where I'm just like, yeah, like you're, everyone's looking at you and everyone's gonna hear what you say. What emotions would go through you? Now, it depends who you are, obviously. It depends where you've been. I mean, some people go, no problem at all, okay? Um, some people, though, would have, uh, some people would be excited and anticipate it. Some people would go, you know what? Eh, kind of, yeah, kind of apprehensive about it. Other people go full of terror. Just no way, just scared to death. Um, what, what would you do? I tell you that story to tell you a true story uh, of my life when I was but a lad, okay? I was 12 years old. I want to tell you about something that happened when I was 12 years old. I, I used to go to, I used to be a Boy Scout. I used to go to a Boy Scout troop at a church. And um, <clears throat> the highlight of being a Boy Scout in that church were Friday afternoon campouts because here's what we would do is we would meet at the, at the church at 3.30 in the afternoon uh, on a Friday and uh, we were all packed up. We had our gear ready to go and we would go, I grew up in Albuquerque, so the mountains are close. We would go camping on Friday night, spend all day Saturday and come home and be back for church on Sunday. Um, <clears throat> but th th I mean, I, just, I can't even begin to tell you how much I anticipated this. This is absolute highlight of the week uh, was whenever we got to go camping on Friday night. Uh, but there was one horrible habit that our scoutmaster had that um, was really just a nuisance. It was really hard. All, all the guys uh, struggled with it, um, me maybe more than most, but he had a really, really annoying habit that I just want to tell you about. He would always pick one of us kids to pray before we could ever leave the parking lot. So he'd go, hey guys, let's circle up, circle up. So he just kind of knew what it was coming, circle up. And then he'd just look around, he'd just randomly pick one of us. And uh, I'd gone there long enough to know that, you know, one of these times it's going to be me. And I, I can't even tell you the terror that went through me. It's like, I don't want to do that. And, and I don't know what, you, what, what happens if you say no. Nobody ever said no. They just would pray. And so, I mean, I would like rehearse, you know, kind of come up with something to say. And, but, but what I would do, uh, I would do probably what some of you would do today. I, I would just hide behind somebody else. I mean, literally, I'd just get behind somebody. Or I knew never look up if you're in a circle. Never look at him. And another strategy I found is if you stand next to him, he tends to not know you're there because he doesn't see you. So I had all these strategies, but inevitably the day came where he said, it's, uh, hey, Cal, why don't you lead us in prayer? And I think I let out an audible sigh, like, oh, uh, you know, kind of like this pathetic, ah. Uh. And uh, he goes, no, yeah, well, t it's your day. Oh, I sucked air back in and I prayed a prayer. I choked it out. No, I choked it up is what I did. I choked. It was the worst prayer ever prayed in the history of mankind. No Boy Scout troop had ever heard a prayer that bad. It was horrendous. I think God was up there going, I know the scoutmaster was going, wow, a lot of work, a lot of work needed there. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I was so positive that every kid was laughing at me behind my back and that I was literally the, you know, the, the joke. And uh, I just felt horrible. I just felt horrible. I was like, please don't ever do that to me again. And uh, 
I knew what was going to happen. We had never been in an accident. We had always been, well, God always watched over, but not this weekend. It's going to be the weekend. And they're going to look in the records again. Who prayed for protection? Oh, it's Cal. <laughs> never again. So what happened was um, uh, nobody, see, I don't know. It was the worst prayer ever, but nobody laughed at me, I suppose. And I didn't hear any talk about it. And strangely enough, the scoutmaster asked me to do it again at another date. And then again, and then, and, you know, it's funny because if you would have told me then that I would be standing here now and that this thing, I, you have no idea how much I pray in public. You have no clue. You certainly don't know what I pray in private, but you have no clue. I, I, I'm asked to pray a lot at different things. I, and, and again, uh, I can't get out of it. Like, you know, like when you get asked to get that Thanksgiving prayer, in your family, you know what I'm talking about? You don't go, oh, no, no. As a pastor, I'm always going to pray if you ask me. I'm always going. I'm never going to say no. And, and so the irony of this guy growing up to be this pastor who prays, and, and sometimes the venues are huge, they're stadiums. Okay, they're big. How in the world did this ever happen? Okay, I want to ask you an important question. I want you to wrestle with this. Do you just know how to pray, or do you have to be taught how to pray? It's a question. I want to put it out there. Do you just know how to pray or do you, you need to be taught? Um, isn't prayer just a few words spoken from the heart? I mean, isn't anything you say better than saying nothing? I mean, come on, how wrong could it possibly be? Um, is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? And, and here's, here's, a, here's an interesting thought. If there's a wrong way, could you be doing it? Could you be doing prayers that, that God has zero chance that he'd ever answer? Could you do it a wrong way? Well, I want to show you this in, in Matthew 6, where I asked you to go. I want to show you this because I want you to see that Jesus said, now listen, it might offend you, there is a right way and there is a wrong way, and some of you are probably doing it the wrong way. And if you're frustrated that prayers aren't getting answered, maybe you're doing it the wrong way. I know it's offensive, but maybe there's a way that he wanted to teach you that if you'd learn, your prayers would be more effective. Wouldn't that be awesome? And so I want to take you to what he said, because he did say there's a right way and a wrong way. There's a w things to do and things not to do. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, this is verses 5 to 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now there's a lot in there. The first thing I want you to point out, I want to point out to you is he said, when you pray. He didn't say if you pray. He said, when you pray. The assumption is, is if you're a Christ follower, if you actually have a heart for God, you will pray. You, you want to communicate. You want to be in uh, a conversation with your creator. That's an assumption, okay? When you pray, not if, when you pray. Um, the second thing he was very clear about is don't pray for show. What does that mean? He, he's, talking about, he's talking about these hypocrites who, who love to stand in places of prominence so they can be heard. And then he says, if you do that because you want to be heard and you want the attention of it, you'll get what you wanted. You'll be heard and you'll get the attention you wanted. That's what you'll get. You won't get God answering anything because you didn't, you didn't listen, you didn't pray to God, you prayed to the crowd. You know what I was doing in that circle? I was praying to a crowd. I wasn't thinking about God at all. I was just thinking about how do I not look like an idiot amongst my 12-year-old peers? That's all I was doing. And it's often what we do is we pray for show. And, and Jesus calls these clowns out and he says, you know what? You're, you're fooling nobody. And so he kind of does that. Um, and, and if that's what you want, you'll get rewarded. You'll, you'll get the recognition you wanted. And then he says, just don't babble when you pray. What does that mean? When he heard the word babble, you know, it's just the idea of just like droning on and on and on, stuttering, stammering, just repeating. Vain repetition is the way it says. Just don't keep, just for the many words, I'll just keep praying and praying and praying because it sounds like I'm, and he says, don't even do that. Don't bother with that. Now, I want to show you this because there's a very important thing that Jesus said that I want you to see. Why should you pray when Jesus said this statement? It was in verse eight. I'll show it to you on the screen here. He said this, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. What? Then why in the world would I waste my time asking for what he already knows? I mean, if he already knows, isn't prayer to inform God? God, you might not be aware, but I have a need. 
You might not be aware, but I have a problem. I have a crisis. God, I need to let you in on something. I need to... Isn't that why we pray? To let God know you need help? What do you mean he already knows what you need? He already is aware? Then why is he asking me to pray? Okay, I'm going to drop something on you right here that if you understand, it will... Okay, it's like, it's a big one. It's counterintuitive, but I want you to understand. I'm going to give it to you in a little sound bite, and then I'm going to give you in a full big idea. A little sound bite. Prayer is for your benefit, not God's. That's the sound bite. Pray, prayer is for your benefit, not God's benefit. Here, here's the full big idea. We need to learn to pray for our own good, not for God's good. And I just need you to think with me through this. Don't check out. Think this through. You, you and I need to learn how to pray for our good, not, not for God's good. Let me, let me explain. P prayer is going to bless you, not God. Prayer is for you, not him. You have a need to talk to God, to rely on God, to cast your cares before God, all of that. He has no need to do any of that for you. He has no need to inform you. He has no need to... Prayer is not for God's... Been it's not like God's up there, I'm so lonely, won't anyone talk to me? Why won't anyone talk to me? No, I talk to me. How come you always never talk to me? You got the wrong image. God is wanting to bless you. And prayer is the vehicle and the avenue in which he does it. So what happens here, in, and again, this all introduction, we'll just, just, we're not going to actually get too deep into it. But here's what you need to understand is that um, according to... Uh, the Gospel of Luke. And by the way, the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew and it's found in Luke. In Luke, uh, this whole thing is all set up by the disciples coming to Jesus and going, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Now, just, wait, wait, what? I mean, don't you typically think that Jesus is, I mean, it'd be like, hey, everybody, hey, 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 class, get your notebooks out, open up fresh piece of paper, get your pens in your hand. I'm going to tell you some stuff about prayer today. It's going to be really important. You need to remember this. Write it down. Don't you kind of picture like, that's not what happened. The disciples are going, Jesus, please teach us. Why would they ask Jesus to teach them? They're not the most astute people out there, if you don't know. But they saw something. Let me, let me say it to you in two things. Why would they ask to be taught? Because of what they witnessed Jesus do. What did he do? He got up early in the morning to go pray. He'd stay up late to go pray. He he'd literally spent hours. He actually looked like he enjoyed praying. They witness all that. I just watched him. So that's one reason why they asked him. Here's a second reason, because they witnessed what prayer, they witnessed what prayer would do. He, he held up, I was there, he held up these two little fish and these five loaves, and he prayed. I don't know, man, thousands and thousands of people were fed. I don't know how to explain it. He just prayed, he said, Father, boom. I know this guy was dead. He was dead, and he prayed for him, and he came out of the grave. The guy couldn't see, but then he could see because he asked his father to have. They saw all that, and they're going, what? Is they knew he knew something they had no idea about, and they were good Jewish boys that had grown up. They go, we don't know what you know. We don't understand what you understand, so help us with that. Can you imagine the opportunity? I mean, like, I don't know. I'm not a golfer. I am a hacker, but I'm not... But it, Gosh, you know what, what if, what if I told you, guess what, you guys, I know this is really bizarre. What if I got up and said, hey, I just need to let you know, man, for the last three months, I've had a private lessons by Tiger Woods. Do you think I'd have gotten a little bit better? You're kidding? You got private lessons? For, yeah, every single week for the last, you know, 14 weeks. Now, that's not true. I didn't, but when you go, unbelievable privilege, right? I mean, if you were a basketball player, and I'm not, but you want to learn how to shoot three-pointers, Steph Curry. Hey, what if he said, I'll teach you. I'll personally teach you. I'll mentor you in this. I'll show you how to do it. What if you wanted to learn how to cook? And Gordon Ramsay, one day wasn't grumpy, Gordon Ramsay <laughs> just said, I'll teach you. Just you and me, man. You and me in the kitchen. This is what they have. They have this incredible privilege. God's son it says, I'll teach you. And, and then you're going, oh, man, this is going to take weeks and weeks and weeks to learn. No, no. In Matthew, it's about five verses. I'm doing this from memory. And in um, Luke, it's three verses. That's all he taught. And, and I also want to clarify something here that I think is really, really important. We call this the Lord's Prayer. 
it's not really the Lord's prayer. It's the disciples prayer. It's them asking him to teach them. It's their prayer. He said, pray like this. And then he prayed. Now, if you want to know what the Lord's prayer is, read John 17. In other words, what was on the heart of Jesus? Like Jesus, when you talk to your father, what do you say? Read John 17, that my followers would be united. That's what he prayed. Yeah, well, we've not done a whole lot of that, but that's what he prayed for us. That's his prayer for us. This is his prayer for them. So let's make sure we understand that. So we're going to do, um, we're going to do a three week study. And again, I had to amend this. So originally it was going to be three separate weeks on, but we're, we're going to break this on the next two weeks. We're just going to go through those verses and, and I'm going to explain. And you might be going, why are we going to do this? I mean, come on. Why are we going to do this? Because if Jesus thought it was important to explain to his disciples, then I think it's important to to have his disciples today understand what he said. And that's you and me. So we're going to hear that. And you, but everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. I mean, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. Can't we just cover something new, something original? I, I got to tell you a little bit of trivia that I just, this cracks me up. This is tr truly funny. Everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. So uh, last year on Jeopardy, okay, on Jeopardy, they asked a simple, simple question and it was about the Lord's Prayer. Well, Joe, Laura, and Shurish had apparently no idea. Uh, Milam uh, Balik uh, asked this question. She said, basically, um, you know, kind of finishes. Matthew 6, 9 says, Our Father, which art in heaven, blank be thy name. And there was silence of epic proportions. There was no answer forthcoming. Um... She repeats the question, no idea. And if you know Jeopardy, say anything. <laughs> say something. Nope, not a single answer came out. And then uh, time ran out, you get the buzzer, and she goes, what is hallowed? Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. And she was like, discuss it. And then, and then Twitter X lit up. It's just some of the answers that came in. People, Jeopardy fans were outraged that these people didn't know it. So that's Hallowed, you heathens. That was one answer, one response. <laughs> hey, Jeopardy geniuses, it's Hallowed. Sheesh, what a sad world we live in. You gotta be kidding. No one knew Hallowed? Screaming Hallowed. <laughs> they didn't know that our father? Like, no, no idea. So here's my point, folks. If Jeopardy geniuses don't know this, maybe we should review it. Even if you go, I know the Lord's Prayer. Maybe we should understand it a little better than we do. Uh, again, just short verses. And by the way, part of what throws you off, let me, I'll, I'll address this more two weeks from now, but part of what throws you off whenever you're saying the Lord's Prayer is that thing at the end. You know what I'm talking about? You do this often enough, you know that thing at the end? That thing at the end is called the doxology. And the doxology, and again, it's worded different ways. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Various ways it gets it. Amen, right? That wasn't, that wasn't in the original text. That was added later. And, and where that gets funky is it all depends on the crowd that you're in. Because if you're in a Protestant crowd, you're probably going to say the doxology. For thine is power in the kingdom. You know, you're going to say that. If you're in a Catholic crowd, you're probably not. So, hey, here's a heads up. You've got to learn how to juke and jive. You've got to know who you're hanging with because it's going to be a clue. Instead... What so often happens is you get to that part and you're like holding your breath going, I ain't going to say it out loud. Because all of a sudden everyone else quit and you're going, I need some power. And, and they're going, what's wrong with you? I don't know, man. We never studied this in my church. Anyway, um, so here's what I want to do. <coughs> I am losing my voice. Here's what you need to understand. In those simple verses, <coughs> three movements. He's going to talk about praise He's going to talk about intercession, and he's going to ask for provision. I'm going to explain this over the next couple of weeks. Praise, uh, intercession, and provision. And then, and then it's going to come back to praise if you say the doxology, because that's what the doxology is. So we're going to tackle that. Now, I'm going to finish here in just a moment. <clears throat> I want you to understand. I'm going to, I'm going to say something I think is incredibly profound. You might not. I do. I want you to understand something. Here it is. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He didn't teach them to preach. There is more power in praying than in preaching. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it. 
we think, oh no, you got to be able to say all these words, or lots of words to people, and that'll get stuff done. No, Jesus goes, that ain't. How do you get stuff done? Talk to my Father. I want to teach you how to pray. So we need to learn how to pray. Uh, not for our, not for God's good, for our good. Okay, make sure we understand that. So what we're going to do today, we're going to do something different. And for some of you, that's going to be weird, you know, awkward. You go, I haven't done this for years and years. I'm asking you to stand up. I'm asking you not to leave. And it goes for here, there, there. Just, I mean, that, that thing about asking you to stand up, that was real. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to say together the Lord's Prayer. And you've been going, oh, no, I don't even know the Lord's Prayer. I got you covered. I'm going to put the words up. <laughs> but every one of these next two weeks now, this week, and the, we're going to show you that little bumper that has all the words of the Lord's Prayer. And, and then we're going to close uh, the, the message part. Now, the, uh, our hosts are going to come back out for just a few moments, so just don't leave. Um, but we're going to just, we're just going to do this for the next uh, two weeks now. But today and the next two weeks, we're just going to say the Lord's Prayer together. So, I want to ask you to do a song. I want to ask you to not just stand up, but speak up. I want, to, I want, to, I want you to say this with, with, with meaning and feeling. And I'm going to just ask you to follow me, okay? And you'll get my cadence and then just do your best to stay somewhere in the ballpark. Okay? And so, here we go. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, awesome job. Do you know what you just did? You know what you just did? I asked you to pray. And I said, would you stand? And you stood. And I said, will you pray this out loud? And you did. And not only that, do you know that people could hear what you just prayed? They could hear you. And you know what else? They could see you. You know what you just did? You just did what I couldn't do when I was a 12-year-old. You didn't choke. You didn't, like, like uh, you didn't hide behind people. Was that you? Yeah. I saw you. You, you just did it. Okay, here's what I think God wants us to understand. Prayer should just be easy. Just be easy. Just be a joy. Just easy. No sweat. No threat. I hope by the time we're done with this series, you just, you get that. All right? Now, I'm going to lead us just to close this service. And again, on all of our campuses, we're not just quite done. We're really close. Let me pray. So, Father, thank you for, thanks for this day. Thanks for the celebration of the great news uh, that Sean and Jen are going to be uh, the, next, uh, <laughs> the next couple that lead this church. And Lord, I'm so excited for them, as, uh, as is our board, as is our leadership. And God, for just the wonderful church that he comes from and the way he's led them and the difference they are making in that community. And God will continue to make. But Lord, we just look forward to the future. So for all of that, we just rejoice. And we are so blessed and, and favored uh, by your goodness. Now, uh, help us as we get into your word that help us to understand what this prayer is all about and how to pray it and how to uh, get what you meant by what you said. And so for the next couple of weeks, God, just give, help us to dig in and have fun with this. And uh, we'll do this in your name. And so to your glory. Amen. Thank you, guys.